Moving Iron Podcast is proud to be part of the Global Ag Network. The network is live, so check out globalagnetwork.com for more details and updates. Now on to the show. Moving Iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving Iron time and time again. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Market Rundown with Sean Hackett. Sean, how you doing this morning? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. And kind of uh, watching these volatile markets these days, which is good to see, actually. Yeah, there's a little bit of volatility. It looks like today must be the down day because yesterday was kind of the semi-up day. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens. There's a lot of stuff going on when you look at, at how the markets are reacting to stuff. But um, two things I want to focus on today, and, and you brought them both up, and, and I'm, I'm glad you did. I've been following them a little bit, but um, obviously you follow them a lot harder than I do. But let's start let's start with the uh, announcement from uh, the Fed yesterday. So um, it came out and said that they were probably going to lower interest rates um, kind of based on what they saw. I feel like the economy is doing good. A few things going on also to kind of counter – what's going on with the tariffs a little bit so talk about that a little bit and it was a sharper down move yesterday in the dollar so talk about that a little bit and how you see that working out well you know there, there's always you know many factors that make grain markets go up or, or down and one of them is the currency to the u.s dollar value and we've been dealing with a strong dollar ever since the trade war um got put in place last year um and, and the fed generally speaking had been you know, tightening, 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 and, and that was their mantra. And all of a sudden, they turned tail a few months back, and, and yesterday said, you know, if this tariff thing continues, we'll, we'll, we are willing to do whatever it takes to keep the U.S. economy stable and growing. Um, and that was the most strongest statement that we've seen, that they were you know, getting ready to do something. And he said, non-conventional methods are going to, going to become more conventional, uh, which means there's other things that they're going to be probably pulling out of their tool chest to help ease monetary policy. And all of this is good for uh, a weaker U.S. dollar, which we've been desperately needing to get our exports going, which have been really under pressure here the last three to six months. So, so the big break in the dollar, the big you know comments from the Federal Reserve saying they're, they're ready and willing to do whatever it takes is, is a positive sign because weaker dollar has always been consistent with higher U.S.-based grain market prices. And so, you know, while... You know, we're never excited about uh, um, government meddling. You know, we are excited when the U.S. dollar starts to have a more bearish trend. It looks like we might have seen this happen this week, and so we're very uh, much watching that trend uh, to see if it can develop and give us kind of a, a headwind, I mean a tailwind versus a headwind, which we've had for a long time. Yeah. So. Well, that, that would be great. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities out there right now um, to get – some u.s crops out there especially with uh with where we're at with soybeans and stuff like that and what we see happening i mean the prices are going to go up so the world um prices are going to go up too along with what we see happening as well so um a lot of pressure out there and this is some actually some positive news uh, for a change so um looking forward to see how that plays out over over the uh, coming months all right so let's jump over here we, we spent a lot of time uh, especially with sean talking about weather and how that's going to affect the market we started talking about this wet weather pattern uh, back in uh, February when it, we were talking about the amount of snow and cold and everything else and what that looked like and how long the cold was going to linger around. And then that was going to switch to more of a, of a wet pattern, and we see that happening here. But the wheat market is one of those crops that have actually benefited from what we see happening here. I mean, again, it's, it's in the same situation. It's getting a lot of rain during times when it doesn't need to get that, that amount of rain. So... Sean, talk to me a little bit about what you see happening in in Russia, Ukraine, you know, Australia, places like that where they have uh, some of the larger wheat producing areas right now. And how is that going to start affecting what we see happening with U.S. wheat? Well, we've talked about many times before that where it's really, really wet, there's always places that's really, really dry. I mean, there's a yin and a yang to weather. Um, and so... Because it's been so wet in the U.S., there are going to be places where they can't buy a drop of rain or they're not going to be able to buy a drop of rain. We know that one of the most important uh, places for wheat 
nowadays is the is Russia. I mean, they just dominate the export market, and you know, Russia is actually probably the most important country production-wise uh, at this point. And last year, you know, they entered a a very hot, dry pattern in June and July, and the wheat market just exploded higher, well over a dollar uh, during that time when the crop. Uh, you know, really got hit because remember right now their winter wheat crop is going through the final development stage of June getting ready for harvest in July so it's just like the United States the difference is they're not going to get the rain when they need it we are getting the rain when we don't Alert need from it from so conference call Casey moving on sorry about that go ahead yeah, so both countries are getting what they what they don't need at a critical stage of development heading into harvest. And so right now, it looks to be really, really hot and really, really dry in the key southern, southwest you know, Russian winter wheat belt. And um, and if this pattern were to persist at all into mid-June, you know, wheat's going to react. Because um, everyone's been expecting that we'd have a rebound in production from last year's poor crop. But already we're seeing some estimates starting to be knocked down already, and, and we could be looking at a crop maybe not that much better than last year if this kind of weather pattern persists. And Russia really, really drives the wheat market. If you recall, when they had the drought in 2011, you know, the wheat market ran up to almost $8, 9 So it's, yeah. a, it's a very, very important region, and we're getting bad weather at exactly the wrong time. So we think the rain market could be shifting from corn leading the way, corn-centric, corn being the dominant market to watch, we think wheat now, especially winter wheat, could be the market to actually pay attention to as, as, a, as a new leader in the grain pit uh, going forward, at least over the next 30 to 45 days. So we're pretty excited that this correction in wheat should be bought here. So Okay. Okay, so let's talk about Mexico buys a ton of wheat from us, man. I mean, they get from Kansas, you know, western Nebraska, northern, north, uh, Western South Dakota, West Texas, and all that stuff. They get there's there's several rain, several rain, several train um, rail systems that go straight to El Paso, right into Mexico. And so there's a there's a pretty good trade route right there for wheat. Now now we're talking about all the stuff we see happening now with this new tariff that could be could be going into effect with Mexico and all that stuff. What kind of effect is that going to have on what you see happening with wheat in the U.S. I would say right now, so long as the weather remains as threatening as it does, it probably takes a back seat, at least for wheat, it does. Okay. Because um, I think that the, when we're talking about losing, you know, 5, 10, 15 million metric tons of fossil production from Russia and elsewhere uh, in the U.S., you know, that, that is not, you know, that, that far outweighs lo- potential loss of export, um, you know, demand over to Mexico. It would probably be something that if, if we, if we do raise the tariffs next week, and if it does escalate 5% a month every month, like he says he's going to do, you know, it could be a problem after the weather market subsides and we go on the other side of the weather market. But right now, as long as weather is as threatening as it is, I do not think that's going to stop the wheat market from going higher. Because I think that that's a far more powerful fundamental, bullish fundamental, than a bearish fundamental would be for Mexico. I would be concerned more about something like the corn market, which is coming on the other side of weather, because they buy a lot of our corn too, by the way, that you know the corn market could be kept back because we're actually you know kind of transitioning or we've traded the late planting and I'm not sure we have a new weather market to trade in corn just yet. So that might be more of, of an impact to keep corn depressed versus wheat at this point. So Right. Okay. So the other the, the, the kind of the sister crop to wheat, the one that, that really tracks back and forth on a on a world scale is rice. And rice has had a uh, you know some in the U.S., it's had some some issues getting planted, um, had some yeah. issues. Uh, so obviously, there's going to be less rice grown in the U.S. than we've seen in the past. And then on the flip side of that, and you start looking at areas of India and China and Southeast Asia, where where rice is a big deal, um, seeing some dry spells down there. So, what's the correlation between the two, and how do you see rice affecting the price of wheat? Well, whenever we're in El Nino, if you look at all the major drought impacts. Uh, in Asia and rice impacts in Asia. It's always occurred during El Nino years. We're in El Nino year and something that's called global angular momentum. We talked about it this week in our report, which is actually the measure of how powerful the upper level winds are, are screaming strong right now. And that's an indication that the atmosphere is acting like an El Nino. A strong 
Global angle of momentum means that the atmosphere, that that's indicative of a strong El Nino reaction in the atmosphere, which means that we would expect a strong impact and correlation to drought in India and in Southeast Asia, especially in places like Indonesia, which have a, you know an extremely high correlation, and they're one of the large importers of rice in the world. So we see all kinds of problems developing for rice production, rice uh, in Asia, it, you know, as we move into this um, Asian monsoon season, so that's another market that we think could outperform. And remember, wheat and rice are highly correlated because the whole world, or at least half the world, lives off of one or the other. So if one gets too high, it switches to the other. If the other gets too high, it switches to the other. So they're, throughout history, they've been highly correlated to each other. So we think that the wheat-rice uh, complex is going to be a leader here based upon what we see with weather moving into the growing season, and it would be a place where you know, there could be some excitement, upward price volatility, especially if we continue to see this El Nino, this um, monsoon trouble move into July. We can get through a, a rough patch in June. If we go into July at all, you know, then it's lights out. And so we're pretty excited. You know, that could be some some excitement there. And and those that are in the you know business of producing rice and wheat who've had a rough go of it. Um, you know, could see some pretty exciting prices for the first time in a long time. So we're 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 very constructive on that, and it's really really based upon this El Nino response to the atmosphere that we're seeing right now. Okay. All right, so let's jump over to the protein complex, take a look what's happened over there. Um, the cattle market has been bouncing all over the place, and there's been a lot of volatility in those markets of late. Um, looked like yesterday the uh, the cattle market had a fairly decent day, but overall the last couple of weeks it's been getting kind of kicked around a little bit. So talk about the cattle market and, and what you see happening there. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when the grain markets took off, uh, we talked about this you know, a couple of times ago or last week. You know, we had this massive short squeeze in the grain markets, and the speculators got just got creamed. And so, when you get creamed, you have to lower your exposure. But there's two ways to lower exposure: take short positions off, take long positions off. And we talked about how there was some extra pressure that was being forced into the livestock market because they were long livestock, short the grains, so they were wanting both positions. We feel that most of the short covering has now taken place in the grains for now, and because of that, we think that the forced long liquidation in the, in the livestock market is probably over now. And yesterday was a pretty important, at least for cattle, we think, was a pretty important bullish reversal from an extremely oversold condition that we think could lead to a sustained rally higher into the midsummer. Seasonals turn up, and actually, when you look at exports for both hogs and cattle, the exports have been absolutely fantastic uh, the last several weeks. I mean, just really, really strong, yet the market has remained under pressure because of this forced long liquidation, so we're pretty excited. Uh, actually, in our, uh, in our work, we have what's called a smart money algorithm. It's this um, algorithm we created to help measure capital flows, and we, we believe we've triggered a, a, a buy signal in the cattle market, the first one we've had. Uh, since late last year, and so that really sets up for a powerful move higher from this overreaction to the downside. So I would say for now, we think the worst is over for livestock, cattle, and hogs, and we think we're ready for a, a pretty sustainable, powerful rally because we do see things starting to align for a better a better period there. Right on. Okay. Well, African swine fever is a thing that just won't go away, man. It seems like it's getting worse. I mean, the, the stuff that I've read, anyways, the news reports I've heard about, um, and they found it in North Korea. They found it in uh, Vietnam. They found it in pretty much everywhere. It's over there. It's South creep- Korea. I mean, it's, it's yeah. I mean, who has who doesn't have it? Yeah, now? East Eastern it's Europe. Really it's bad. creeping into it's really Eastern bad. Europe. You know, it's just all over the place. So, um, even though the Chinese have, are testing testing a a, uh, a vaccine here for it, um, there's a hundred million pigs over there that that. Uh, they're going to take forever just to, just to simply inoculate. It'll take forever. So, um, but you know, we had that we had that reaction um, to the hogs there for a minute, and then things really took off. But they they've kind of sharply been down, and and they've kind of bounced around a little bit with some volatility. So, where where's the uh, how come how come the African swine fever news that we've seen right now, where basically. You know, a third of the world is infected by this African swine fever is not having a bigger effect on on the U.S. hog market. So much of short trading, Casey, is is sentiment. You know, there's reality 
in the perception of the reality on a short-term basis. In the longer term, fundamentals and, and price you know, are, are pretty well together. But on a short-term basis, we ran the market up on this excitement, and then when the trade war escalation kicked in, the sentiment changed to, even though exports for hogs have been phenomenal, I mean, China's, China's still buying right. immense amount of exactly. pork. Yep. I mean, huge. The sentiment changed. And then, of course, throw in Mexico. Mexico is the largest buyer of pork, uh, right? And they have been historically. Uh, and so it just it soured um, the market sentiment at a time when the speculative community was getting ripped in their shorts and were being forced to sell in the hog market. And this was just a good reason for them to justify why they should lower the long positions in hogs. So what it means is, is that we've, we've gotten disconnected from reality short term. Um, but we will relink up. No, we might already be relinking up. But you know, there's not, you're not going to continue to persist to see those kinds of exports coming uh, out of the U.S. Um, and, and have hog prices come down forever. There's going to be a relinking. We think we've probably taken the hog market probably as low as we can go without relinking. And maybe yesterday we, we did relink. So we're, we're pretty positive that this break is a tremendous opportunity uh, to play, which we think is going to be a pretty exciting second half story when shortage really, really enters, you know, the crescendo or the, the really, really big part of this shortage will become truly understood by then. So, so you know, we know markets move around. We know there's all kinds of reasons why they do it. But in this case, you know, volatility, we talked about the reason why volatility is good because it gives you opportunities to do smart things. The downside volatility and cattle and hogs is an opportunity to buy. That's mm-hmm. how we see it right now. Right on. All right, Sean, lots of stuff going on. If folks want to reach out to you and pick your brain on some stuff or maybe just get some more information about what kind of services you offer, how would they do that? Our website is Tackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. You know, sample reports, webinars, white papers, all kinds of good things tell you more about what we do uh, to see if our way of looking at things in our analysis would be helpful to your listeners. Right on. Right on. All right. So make sure you check out Demi Mason's new book, Do Business Better. If you want a uh, Moving Iron podcast, Kuzi, give me a shout on Twitter. DM me here and I'll send you some out. Sean, you should be getting yours in the mail about any day here. And Ford is a long ways from uh, from Nebraska, so it takes a little bit. But uh, but also tonight at 6 o'clock Central, George Burkhaw will be on to talk about uh, what's going on with crop insurance and, and some of these important dates and how uh, folks can protect themselves against uh, the stuff that's out there right now as far as this uh this inclement weather and, and planning patterns that we see right now so six o'clock here live on twitter uh george burkha will be be joining me to t- take live questions and answers here from from the from the cast and crew out there on twitter so uh sean i guess till next week have a good one we'll talk to you then bud that's good mr casey have a great week all right you too man thanks for listening to this edition of the moving iron podcast now part of the global ag network if you'd like to continue any of these conversations you can hit me up on facebook twitter or instagram at moving iron llc you can also send me an email at moving iron podcast at moving iron podcast.com you can also visit the moving iron podcast youtube channel and watch market roundup with chip nellinger sean hackett and angie setzer also tax news with glenn birnbaum Please visit movingironllc.com. Here you can find information, details, and updates for the 2019 Moving Iron Summit in Nashville, Tennessee. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can leave a review and subscribe at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, and globalagnetwork.com. So until next time, let's go move some iron. This is Casey Seymour, out. Moving iron in the 21st century. See